so, so the agenda is that first will be Jakub, uh, followed by Mateusz and, and, and Henrik. So the first speaker is Jakub. So Jakub has a background in computer science. Uh, he was working in algorithms for many years, doing a PhD here in Warsaw. Uh, and for his track record in, in research in algorithms, he received Vital Lipsky Award. But recently, Kuba is also interested in, in machine learning, and we'll talk about this today. He's working at the University of Warsaw, but also collaborating with, with Samsung. So with this, I'd like to welcome Jakob on the stage. Thank you. Uh, oh, I have to stand here, <laughs> actually, to see something. Uh, my presentation is actually not only about machine learning, but also about classical algorithms. And I would like to say, um, how can we have some interesting interplay between classical algorithms and machine learning? And actually, I will be speaking about how can we enhance performance of classical algorithms using, using techniques of machine learning. Uh, I will start with a toy example that uh, will show the main ideas behind this, this interplay between the, those two areas. Then we proceed to some real-world world application and finally conclude and mention other, other work in this area. This is a pretty recent area. The, the first paper, uh, like the start of this particular area, was uh, a paper from last year. And since then, there have been many papers on, on this particular area. Uh, the toy example is something that <laughs> looks very known. Uh, assume we are given a sorted uh, increasing array of integers and we are given some query integer, and we would like to find, we know that it is from this array, we know that it exists somewhere in this area, and we would like to know where does it, where is it located in the array. So for example, given a query 29, we know that we, we can find the position, it's located at the fifth position of the array. Uh, there is a well-known classical algorithm solving this problem efficiently, uh, which is binary search, uh, in which uh, let me just remind it to you. Uh, we start with the element located in the middle of the array, and we compare the query integer with this element. If they are equal, then hooray, we have found the right element. Otherwise, if the uh, query uh, integer is smaller, then we go to the left part of the array and search recursively. And if the query integer is greater, then we go to the right part of the array and search recursively. That's Pretty simple. Uh, what can we say about efficiency of this approach? Well, a query takes at most a logarithmic number of comparisons. Uh, this is because the search, uh, the, the fragment of the array where we are supposed to search, at each step halves, approximately halves. So after a logarithmic number of steps, we will certainly find the right element. And usually, unless we are pretty lucky, we'll take this logarithmic number of steps to find, to find the element. Uh, and how can we introduce machine learning to this problem? Uh, assume we were given, we, we have trained some predictor uh, that learned where, uh, that was given this array and uh, was supposed to learn where each element appears in this array. So this predictor doesn't store the whole array, but it has learned the distribution behind the array. and it, has uh, some good idea where the elements should be located in this, in this array. I'm not saying how we got this predictor. We somehow trained a neural network, whatever, so that we are able to find, uh, to find the right element. So then we ask the predictor, uh, how can we use this predictor? Well, of course, we can uh, ask uh, the, the predictor about the position of this element in the array. And uh, if we find the right uh, element, if the predictor is completely accurate, then of course the algorithm is extremely simple and fast. But of course, as we know in machine learning, there are some errors and uh, it might be the case that the element is, uh, uh, is not the, the right, is, it is not the right position. So then we should test either to the left or to the right, starting from that element until we find the right element to uh, the, the right element that we are looking for. So here, for, if the predictor predicted that it is located at this position where actually 33 is, then the predictor is not very wrong, uh, but it is not exactly right, so we have to go to the left until we find actually the right, the right position. Uh, so what is good uh, about this algorithm? 
If the predictor is very accurate, then we have something that is faster than binary search. But machine learning is usually uh, very efficient only on average. And if we have at least one inaccurate prediction, then the time complexity can be actually very bad. We might need to go through the whole array in order to find the element that we are looking for. And now the question is, in this toy example, uh, uh, how could we mix those two uh, attempts, binary search and machine learning, to have something that has uh, the, the, the pros of, all, of both approaches? And actually, this is not uh, something very new. We can combine these two ideas using doubling. So the, the idea is, OK, we start with the prediction of the predictor. Uh, assume here that it is very bad so that the example looks, looks nicer. And then, uh, well, if it was OK, then obviously we would be done. But then, since it is not OK, uh, we will actually not go one element by one element, but we will use doubling. So first, we will jump by one element then by two elements, then by four elements, and we continue these kind of jumps until we reach an element that is smaller than the, the query integer, which is 29. Obviously, we could exceed the array, but then we will just stop at the leftmost element of the array. And what do we know now? We know that the previous element was greater, and now we have reached an element that is smaller, and now we can do binary search on the final interval that is left and then find the right element. So we started with what the predictor gave, and then tried to find the exact position of the element in the array. Uh, how good it is? Well, doubling uh, also works in logarithmic time, uh, because every, in every step, uh, the, the jump doubles. So, so after a logarithmic number of steps, we'll be already at the beginning of the array. And then, as we already saw, binary search works in logarithmic time. So then the total number of comparisons is like logarithmic in terms of n. This is a correct analysis, but <laughs> it doesn't tell us anything here in this example. Uh, we should try to focus on something else, on the error of the predictor. Uh, assume that t of q is the actual position of this query integer in the array. Then we can define the error of the predictor as the absolute value of the difference between the actual position of the element in the array and what the predictor gave us. Then we can actually see that each of those steps works in logarithmic time, but not only with regard to n, but with regard to the error of the predictor. Because like this is just the because basically this is the part that we are supposed to travel in the array to find the right the right the right position of the element. So as a summary, we considered three approaches. One was classical algorithm, uh, which works in logarithmic time basically always. The other one used machine learning predictions, which uh, maybe on average was very fast, but in some cases it was extremely slow. And then we found the best of those two, uh, which is also works in, the logarith in logarithmic time in the worst case, but if we are lucky enough, or if the predictor is very good, very smart, then the algorithm is actually much faster. Okay, this was only a toy example. Obviously, nobody does uh, binary search using machine learning, probably. Uh, but this idea can be uh, uh, used uh, in a, a real-world setting. Uh, let us recall uh, B-trees. We want to enhance B-trees. Uh, a B tree is a kind of a, a balanced binary search tree uh, that is all commonly used in databases. Uh, a B tree uh, it has so, some uh, internal nodes, and all the leaves are usually assumed to be at the same level. And each node stores some number of keys, at least one, but it can store many keys. This is actually a parameter of the B tree. Uh, and those keys are stored in, a, uh, in an increasing order, and they subdivide the area that we want to uh, consider. So, for example, in the root here, uh, in this toy example, the, the elements are just letters of the alphabet, and here in the root, we have two subranges. So the root divides the, the, the whole space into two subranges, and then this happens recursively in all in remaining internal nodes. Uh, so the, a B tree can be looked at as kind of iterative binary search. We make one binary search in, in one node, then we proceed to another node, then we have to find 
uh, make binary search in another and proceed and so on until we find the right position of the element in the B tree. Usually we assume that ac the actual elements that are stored in the B tree, so like the, the, the database, are stored in some external memory and all the internal nodes well, hopefully can be accessed uh, much faster. So only the lowest level is actual data. And in this uh, analysis, we will assume that the data are static. So this means that uh, uh, we are not inserting uh, new elements or deleting new elements. Uh, one could think about using this approach also in the fully dynamic variant, but here it's just simpler to assume that. So all the data are static, so the structure of the B3 doesn't change. And the question is, can we actually try to enhance uh, somehow the B3 with using machine learning? To do this, uh, it is actually good to look at a B tree as a model. As a, as a the model, so a B tree is a data structure that, in some sense, we have to imagine that it predicts where a key is located in the memory. Well, of course, it knows because it's a deterministic data structure. So, given an element, it shows us a range, meaning the the leaf node where the element is located, and then we can find the right position uh, of this element uh, using binary search or doubling depending on, on what is the output of the, of the B tree. So it, so it gives us a very good approximation, a deterministic approximation of where the element is located. So it's a kind of a predictor, right? Because it's given, given uh, it learns the distribution of the elements and shows us where a given element is, is in this distribution. Uh, so we could imagine any uh, such predictor, this will be called a learned index here. So any model, it can be a neural network or whatever, that also learns the distribution of the elements and tries to predict the position of an element. Uh, such a learned index has some error. A B tree has a very deterministic error, uh, usually the size of the page because it has to re read the page and then find the right element. And the learned index has some error. It can have different, make different errors for different elements but we can compute it, especially if the data are static, then we can basically query for all the data in the database and just, and just check what are the errors. Uh, so why not get rid of a B tree and use a fully uh, connected two-layer neural network for 200 million web server logs and see what happens? Let us just train the, the network see how, how good it works comparing to the, given the static collection of, web, uh, of uh, log records, how well does it work comparing to a B tree? Well, <laughs> you can imagine that it's, uh, it's a disaster actually. It works uh, much, much worse than a B tree. Uh, the reason, the intuitive reason is that uh, machine learning is good, better at learning just a few things at a time, not uh, like the whole distribution of everything. It's not so accurate as a B tree. Uh, so th this was uh, so this didn't we just uh, this is the uh, average uh, time uh, of a query and uh, it doesn't uh, so it's some indication of what is the actual error of this of this query. Uh, so this was the first approach of the team by uh, of Kraskal now, but then actually an another idea was considered. Uh, so it's better to somehow store the idea of a tree but not store a complete B tree, but try to use several blocks. And each of those blocks should be either a B tree or a neural network. So we have some structure, some, a tree-like structure, but it's not actually a tree, it's a directed a cyclic graph of models. Each model can be either a B tree or a neural network. And uh, these models point, so given a, key, given a key, the model points uh, to one of the models in the next level of the tree where the key should be sought. And then in the, in the, bottom, in the bottom layer, the key is given some position, and then in the end, depending on what, what was the error, we find the, the, right, the, the right position of the element, again, using doubling. Uh, how to choose? Uh, which model should be a B tree and which model should be a neural network? Well, since the data are static, you can just check that. So we can just use some structure of neural networks 
And then uh, if uh, one of these networks returns very, has very big errors, then we can just get rid of it and put a B3 instead of it. So we usually uh, it was the case that it's better to have a neural network on the top of the tree and uh, on the bottom uh, B-trees uh, helped to find the right position of the element, so they were more accurate. Uh, and using this approach, actually, uh, this is the experimental side of uh, cross canal, uh, they managed to achieve very uh, good results comparing to a B-tree. Uh, uh, for example, for, for one particular kind of data, uh, the queries were three times faster, and actually the space was 10 times smaller using the right, uh, like this approach and some neural networks and uh, some B-trees. Um, so this is a, an example that we can actually have something that is faster, much smaller, and somehow adjust to the data. In the worst case, this solution is just a B-tree. So it's like in the example of a binary search. If the predictor is very bad, we get rid of all the neural networks and we simply use B-trees everywhere. So if the distribution is somehow weird. But otherwise, if we can learn the distribution, we can benefit from it and obtain very good, a very good data structure. So this was a, a breakthrough paper from, from last year. And since then, there, were, there was other work. Uh, but let us first think, what are the, the main takeaways of this, of this idea, of this joining of machine learning and classical algorithms? Well, what are the weak sides of machine learning? It's good, but it's good only on average. And as I already mentioned, it's, better, it's best if we just learn some some particular distribution, not learn, try to learn everything at all in the, in the first place. Uh, then, on the other hand, classical algorithms are also in some sense imperfect. Of course, they try to optimize uh, for the worst case scenarios, but then for the average case scenario or just real world <laughs> case scenario, because average is also not, 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 not exactly real world. Uh, they can be overly cautious and actually spend too much time just to make sure that they are good on the worst case. And then, if one can, tries to get rid of classical algorithms in their natural, the natural places where they are used, then actually, and put machine learning instead, then actually it's not always the right, the right uh, idea. But then we can try to take the best of the two worlds and somehow, and this can improve actually both, both attempts. And uh, as I mentioned, other uh, approaches were, uh, other problems were, were already studied from this perspective. Uh, this seminal paper also considered uh, implementing hash maps and implementing bloom filters, which are a data structure which just given an element just returns whether the element is, is in the data structure or not and can have uh, false positives. So it cannot have false negatives, but it can say for a given element that, that actually it's not, uh, uh, it is in the index, but it's actually not. But, but so these data structures are very, very robust and find find some applications. And since then, uh, other other problems were studied. Uh, there is a nice area of study of online algorithms. Uh, for example, the paging problem, where we are uh, given some uh, s some number of pages on the disk, and we have a limited cache and when we try to uh, uh, try to address a page, and if if it is in the cache then we actually just take it and it's for free, but if it's not in the cache, then we have to pay a lot for getting this, this page to the cache. And then in this area, for example, the known uh, algorithm uh, of least recently used uh, gives, uh, is good even comparing to the uh, optimal solution offline, which actually knows all the queries. And then one can actually show that using a different randomized algorithm and machine learning, one can beat both in, in theory and in practice the, the basic idea of, of least recently used. And other problems were studied here. And also the, the, the same team of Krask as well studied the problem of text indexing. So then we are given a text and we, are, we have some queries uh, about substrings and we want to know whether these substrings occur in the text or not. And then again, uh, such so, uh, again, such an approach of this recursive structure of models was was used there, uh, and other uh, they are also considering sorting. Uh, so one can think that actually 
we can consider like every <laughs> possible classical algorithm and see whether there is an interplay of it with machine learning. It's not completely clear how to do it uh, in all cases, so there is no, no, no general rule, but actually it can be beneficial uh, to, to try. Thank you, Kuba, for the, for the talk. So we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I'll try not to run with the mic, so please try to ask the question loud enough and we will repeat it. If it will not work, then we will run with the mic. Okay, so the question is what happens if the top model, for example, gi predicts a position of the key which is totally incorrect and we go to a, to a model that doesn't even know what to do with this element? Well, we treat it as a very big error. If it's uh, because we see that the structure is not a complete tree, so it's not a tree; it's more than a tree. So sometimes the key can actually come back to the right uh, to the right path. Uh, but if it's completely wrong, then it's just a big error. And then, yeah. for some elements, we might have such errors, and for some elements, it's better to replace it by a B tree. Any more questions? Yes. So the question is why neural networks and not something else? It's like, yeah, it's like it was a, because basically the, the, the idea was not to really optimize the solution to, for this problem, but give an example that this, this, that this actually can be done. So they like really didn't try to like work a lot on, on optimizing this particular uh, neural network or something else. Henrik? Okay, so the question is about learning parts of the distributions by machine learning, and uh, are there these kinds of data sets? Well, obviously, when we consider data from <laughs> real world uh, applications. Uh, for example, you asked about sorting. In sorting, uh, the idea was to use machine learning to, like similar as here, to just try to foresee where more or less is the element located, and then when we have few inversions, we apply uh, an efficient algorithm then, so uh, an efficient sorting algorithm, but just for parts of the of the data. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, but it, like, we somehow try to find, usually you like just cut the data into parts, that's the, the idea, so that then machine learning it, like finds it easier to, to learn a part of the distribution. But. So I have one also question. So you said that the, you assume the data is static. What if there are modifications? Okay, well, what if the data, ah, I don't have to repeat this question. <laughs> you have a mic. Uh, what if the data is not static? Well, one can imagine that uh, when, we, well, when we change a binary search tree, we have to make some rotations and some other operations to, to, to make it balanced. Uh, and this can be considered as retraining uh, the model uh, of a B tree. <laughs> so, so somehow, uh, uh, somehow this, is, this is kind of, re how does retraining look like in uh, classical algorithms? So here one would also need to make some retraining. Uh, for this, uh, well, uh, there is no uh, actual uh, complete answer to this, to this question, what, what can be done. The question is what is the rate of insertions and deletions in the data? If it's low, then you can basically take the cost of retraining uh, a part of this, a part of the structure. Uh, I know that uh, uh, here uh, it was considered uh, to use uh, a neural network that was pre pretty optimized to retrain. So it was not, not it didn't take uh, hours or days to retrain. But if the number of queries uh, changing the data is large, then I don't know if there is a good answer to this question. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. So now we welcome Mateusz. Mateusz, please set up. In the meantime, I will introduce you. So Mateusz, uh, Mateusz did his PhD at the Max Planck Institute. He currently works at uh, DeepMind in London. So Mateusz, uh, for, for a few years, worked at the intersection of computer vision and uh, NLP. And he's mostly well known for his works about visual question answering. But more recently, he's also interested in, in reinforcement learning. So let's welcome Mateusz. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction. 
so today I will be talking about sideways, and sideways is a depth parallel training of uh, video models that approximates backpropagation training scheme. And this is a joint work with uh, Grzegorz, Joa, and uh, Viorica. So in many real-world scenarios, we are expecting that uh, our agents are not on, do not only have a powerful perceptual system, but can also act uh, quickly and also can adapt to new situations quickly. For instance, in self-driving situation, uh, the car needs to continuously adapt to new uh, challenges, to new cities, uh, to new road situations, uh, to new weather, uh, weather conditions. Maybe I can leave it, actually. Uh, or other scenarios uh, that are common in uh, robotics. Again, we are expecting that the robots are uh, extremely responsive. Uh, they can, again, adapt to new situations, for instance, uh, to new ping pong strategies. However, here we are not really working uh, hands-on on, uh, on, on those practical problems like self-driving and uh, robotics. Uh, these are just concrete examples of a much broader learning problem that we are interested in. And this problem is uh, real-time online and causal learning with uh, smooth and, and potentially infinite input uh, sequences. So you can think of audio, you can think of uh, video, uh, vi video uh, sequences, etc. So those streams are uh, smooth and have also redundant information that is carried over the time dimension to the neighboring data, fr data frames. And here there is this exam that, uh, that you can see uh, at the bottom. Uh, the first four frames, uh, it's pretty low resolution because this is coming from the, from the real data set. Uh, but I guess you can barely see the difference between, between those uh, two consecutive uh, frames. And the reason is that uh, often those videos are pretty smooth. Unfortunately, the uh, standard backpropagation algorithm is not well suited uh, for, uh, for this learning scenario since uh, it introduces blocking during the, the, the training uh, where all the competitions have to be done sequentially. So during the single update cycle, uh, the information is, uh, in, in backpropagation is, is propagated from the, from the bottom to the uh, top and next uh, from the uh, top and uh, to the bottom and this is done sequentially so the only one datum is uh, considered during this uh, update cycle so this results in low throughput and a high latency that uh, potentially can impact uh, training time so far the main direction that has been investigated in the past in making those training uh, uh, training uh, training of those large models on large data sets uh, faster is to simplify optimizer and uh, optimizer and especially if you are familiar with continuous optimization uh, then uh, you already seen this uh, trend of uh, giving up uh, more expensive uh, second order optimizers such such as uh, a newton method uh, where you have to compute inverted hessian to model curvature of the loss in favor of simpler models such as uh, gradient descent so in gradient descent we are just uh, relying on uh, on uh, on gradients, so we are losing uh, some access to some information about the curvature. Uh, but uh, computing those gradients is much faster than uh, computing inverted Haitians. Uh, this Cartesian uh, space uh, should be uh, seen metaphorically. So correctness means uh, to have some some nice uh, mathematic uh, mathematically nice uh, uh, properties, such as, for instance, nice uh, convergence rate. Uh, while speed here means uh, to have uh, fast training. Uh, but in, 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 in practice. Uh, however, we can even do simpler stuff uh, that we are likely familiar with. Uh, it's called uh, stochastic gradient descent, where here we are computing uh, the gradient's information only over the partial loss instead of uh, the whole loss over the whole training data set. Uh, we are basically uh, computing the gradients over the, the loss over the batches that are sampled from the, uh, from the training set. Uh, so on one hand, this uh, training strategy introduces uh, extra noise that is, uh, uh, that is coming from, from the sampling error. Uh, and uh, thus there is uh, stochasticity introduced in the, in the, learning, uh, in the training scheme. Uh, but on the other hand, we can uh, update the weights of the model uh, based on the uh, partial uh, training set. So we, we, we don't have to wait uh, uh, to process or to loop over all training examples in order to uh, to uh, to update our models, we can uh, we can do this much much quicker, uh, and in practice uh, it leads to 
uh, much uh, faster faster training not necessarily convergence but uh, but faster training of big uh, models on large data sets in practice uh, quite interesting there's also some recent evidence that uh, uh, this noise this added st stochasticity may play a, a role of uh, implicit regularization in in training neural networks uh, so this is also quite uh, uh, quite interesting, but it, it's not only about the speed. It, it turns out that uh, generalization might also be actually better uh, while using those uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, algorithms. Okay, so uh, saying that, uh, the question is if we can do uh, better. Uh, if we can, for instance, give up uh, some kind of mathematical correctness or mathematical niceness uh, in favor of, uh, uh, of, of having uh, faster training. Uh, so, so far, in the past, we have been working in general setting, mainly with uh, images. Uh, however, now we are slowly progressing towards more temporal data, such as videos or audio, uh, that potentially have much more information. Like, for instance, videos have information about the motion. And uh, this extra information could actually help in uh, training models that, uh, that understands better visual uh, scene, uh, since otherwise, in images, uh, this information is just missing. Uh, however, training uh, those models on videos uh, is challenging. Uh, videos are uh, large volumes, and uh, there are many challenges imposed by this. Uh, training time is slow of those models, and uh, uh, likely it requires uh, quite a lot of uh, memory. So for instance, one minute video is equivalent to roughly uh, 1,500 1, uh, images. Uh, on the other hand, uh, those video clips are uh, smooth, and also to some extent they contain redundant information that is not uh, exploited at all by the existing uh, uh, training algorithms. And this is something that we are trying to change. Yeah, and uh, we are doing this by pipelining. So this is concept uh, that is often used in uh, modern processors where various pipelining strategies are used in order to speed up computations. Uh, to, to have more efficient use of uh, hardware resources, uh, and in general to maximize throughput. Uh, so in pipelining, larger instructions are decomposed into simpler ex uh, instructions that are next processed uh, at the same time by different uh, pipeline units. So for instance, in this case, there are like five, four different uh, pipeline units that are executing uh, those instructions at the uh, simultaneous at the same time. Uh, so why not to uh, be inspired by this, and why not to bring this into, uh, into the deep learning world? Uh, however, before moving to the actual algorithm, I would like to here first revisit regular backpropagation and also uh, talk a little bit about the, the issues that regular backpropagation uh, has. So uh, for this, let us have, have some illustrative uh, examples, and this is uh, one of them. Uh, so in backpropagation, uh, the input is, uh, uh, which is here, this person that is uh, uh, doing uh, bench, mat, uh, bench press, is uh, uh, first giving to the first layer of the neural network. This produces the activations. The activations are next uh, put into the next second layer of the neural network. This produces uh, uh, next layer of activations and uh, that are next uh, uh, passed to the next layer of the neural network and so on. Uh, so at each layer of the neural network, we get uh, more and more abstract uh, representation of the input. So uh, at the beginning, we have uh, this pixel space, those, those pixels representing uh, a person uh, that is doing uh, bench press. Well, at the top layers, we have, uh, we have concept that corresponds to, uh, to bench press. Uh, so it's like uh, ma more high level representation. Uh, yeah, and here we have like two, two most bar, uh, forward paths going up and back paths uh, uh, doing down. Uh, however, the back application does not really happen instantaneously. Uh, and here I, I'm showing the, the more realistic view of what is happening with the uh, back propagation. Uh, so, uh, so, so here I'm doing the, the unrolled in, in time, so you can see how how, how the uh, how the propagation evolve in in the time so we have like uh, this x uh, axis which which is about the time and y axis which is about uh, the depth of, of of neural network and uh, by having this view we can see that uh, uh, that first frames are uh, passed to the next layer of the neural network and then push forward in time 
and then to the next layer, push forward to the time, etc. Right? So we have like going up, but also in this uh, kind of diagonal direction, and then going down to the back propagation uh, uh, to this guy, uh, to, to this guy here. Uh, and since uh, back propagation is not instantaneous, but instead it is a computational process, so it requires some time. Uh, the, uh, in reality, the back propagation introduces a blocking mechanism. So all those uh, computations here are, are, are blocked, and this results in uh, low throughput and uh, high lat latency. So this can be also seen here. So under, basically, we can imagine a situation where we have uh, uh, different frames of the of the video, and for some reasons uh, uh, we, we don't want to block the computations. We don't want to also buffer those data frames. And in this case, during the whole update cycle, in the forward pass and the back pass, we are just losing all those uh, all those frames. And uh, of course, by uh, by losing those frames, we we presumably uh, also lose uh, final uh, accuracy. Uh, yeah, and uh, finally, backpropagation can be uh, uh, can be written recursively using those two uh, backprop back rules. Uh, the first one is about the weight updates. Another one is about uh, uh, taking the guardian from the top and then pushing the guardian to the uh, to, 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 to down. Uh, what is important here is that. Uh, in this rules for the back propagation, we are combining uh, gradients from the top with Jacobi matrices indicated by J uh, of the current activations, right? So you can think that basically uh, this, this gradient going uh, from the top to the down, and then there's a Jacobi matrix that is uh, doing some, uh, some computations here, and then combination of those two information is giving the weight update and, uh, and the gradient that can be pushed down. Okay, uh, on, uh, on, on, on the other hand, uh, uh, sideways training that we have uh, proposed here is removing this blocking uh, mechanism between the frames. Uh, so the idea is that uh, all, the, uh, all, all, the neural net, uh, all the neurons in the neural networks in all the layers are working uh, simultaneously and, uh, and are processing this informa information uh, all the time. Uh, so here, colors means that uh, um, where the uh, where the information has originated from during the uh, forward pass. So if the, we have, let's say, the forward pass that is going in this direction, then uh, this information, like this activation, came from or has originated uh, from this uh, green uh, data uh, data frame. So it's like a very colorful uh, picture. Um, however, uh, in the Sideways, we, we increase throughput because now we are working with uh, with all the uh, with, with all the uh, neurons uh, at the same time, uh, and we also reduce latency because uh, uh, because now we, we are just taking all the all those frames uh, into account. However, we are losing uh, mathematical correctness. Uh, so right now, I will explain more slowly how the sideways works and how we are losing this uh, mathematical correctness. Uh, of doing uh, sideways propagation, let's call it in this way. So, like before in the forward pass, uh, we process the input and uh, pass this input to the uh, to the next uh, layer and so on. And also, we are pushing this uh, forward in the in uh, in time. At uh, time, l l let us consider time uh, time step uh, t5, which is uh, like in the middle somewhere here. Uh, and then we can see that we have uh, uh, three, uh, three, three, three layers that, uh, uh, that are processing the information. The top layer is processing information that is coming from the blue frame. Uh, then the middle one uh, processing information that is coming from the yellow frame. And that bottom one is uh, processing the information that is coming from the, uh, from the red frame. Uh, OK, and uh, now in the next step, the this uh, blue, uh, blue, blue, blue guy, which is, uh, uh, which, which is the gradient that is, uh, uh, that is computed uh, with respect to, uh, that is computed for, for the loss uh, with respect to the activations that are coming from, uh, from the blue frame, is uh, combined together with the uh, Jacobi matrix that uh, has been originated, or uh, uh, Jacobi matrix where activation has been originated in the in the yellow uh, frame. 
Uh, so, 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 so this uh, represents uh, the combined information uh, from from this uh, uh, blue frame and uh, yellow frame. And then, we, if we if we do the next step, and again we are like uh, uh, pushing those gradients down towards lower layers, and in time, uh, in 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 future, uh, we are again combining this uh, combined gradient together with uh, Jacobi matrix that is coming from the uh, from the red frame, uh, so it's uh, getting more colorful. Uh, and then we continue this process, uh, and again we continue this process. Uh, so such a way of doing backpropagation increases throughput, uh, however it also reduces maxima, uh, ma mathematical correctness, and this can be seen by, uh, uh, by, by this colorful example here, or it can also be seen by, by those uh, uh, sideways rules that replace the, the backpropagation rules here. Uh, so what is basically is the saying is that here we are combining uh, the the gradients like like if you consider this the second top uh, top layer here which is also uh, indicated by uh, by the by the red border uh, then we clearly see that uh, that we are combining the uh, the blue gradient information uh, with uh, uh, with yellow uh, Jacobi uh, uh, matrix, right? So we are we, we are combining this blue with uh, with the yellow guy uh, in order to uh, to get the uh, update and backpropagation. Uh, and roughly speaking, you can think that uh, here we are combining the information that is coming from from two different uh, sources of the information. Uh, uh, so by this, we are losing the correctness. Uh, if we take all the units uh, here into account again, then sideways looks like that. And once the pipeline is full, then uh, then all layers are busy and uh, and are working uh, simultaneously in forward and uh, backward uh, uh, directions. Uh, and of course, this can be rolled again uh, back in time. And here, there's this animation that is showing how the things are processed and how the things are also combined from the top. So it's like going up and then. And there's classification, and then uh, this information it's, uh, it's going back. Uh, and here we can also uh, do a side-by-side -side comparison between uh, the uh, regular uh, backpropagation, which is on the right, uh, with the sideways, which, which is on the left. So uh, we, we see that uh, uh, in this uh, illustration, of course, we see that uh, sound sideways is, uh, is, is, is much faster. It's just uh, it's, it's const const constantly, continuously busy uh, of, of doing something like forward pass and uh, uh, back pass. Okay, but now the question is why why this is working at all? Uh, so I will give a few intuitions that we had during developing this algorithm. So first of all, uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, works, and uh, this can be seen as a so has you get in this end with uh, added noise, and this noise is also coming not only from the sampling error, like in the so has you get in this end, but also from this misalignment between the Jacobi matrices and, and, and the gradient that I uh, mentioned before. Uh, second, if we assume that the signal is very, very smooth, uh, then at the limits we have basically the same frame, uh, like in all the inputs. And if we, if we consider uh, this case, then uh, sideways, Reduces to backpropagation. It's, it's basically the same. Uh, it's the same rule because we are now combining the information that is coming from different time steps. But information uh, from different time steps is basically the same. Uh, the, the same information. Uh, and then at the end, uh, it's uh, uh, in uh, in videos we have some. Uh, we, we we often can decompose temporal signals, like for instance video signals, into slow features and. Uh, and uh, fast features. So slow features are those features that uh, uh, that corresponds to the category. Like for instance, there is uh, there is me and uh, and category Mateusz doesn't change at all. So it's it's like I, I'm moving, but it's the same category. Uh, and uh, fast features are the, the the features that are evolving quickly, uh, and those can correspond, for instance, to to the edges or to the boundaries of me. So if I'm moving around, then those boundaries, those edges are. Uh, also uh, changing uh, a lot and evolving quickly. Uh, so uh, if uh, deep learning is doing this kind of decomposition and presumably is doing this, uh, then we can also express some kind of smoothness in all, all, all those activations, uh, uh, which, we, which again uh, makes, uh, makes training uh, uh, possible. 
Uh, okay, we have evaluated this method on uh, three video data sets. Here I'm talking, uh, presenting two action recognition data sets, HMDB51 and QCV101. Uh, so it's action recognition, meaning that you have this video, uh, and, and then at the end you, your neural network has to, uh, has to classify this, and, and, and labels are action labels. Uh, and on HMDB51, we achieve competitive results to do regular web propagation. Uh, with VGG8 uh, uh, net uh, train with sideways, we get slightly better results than by propagation. Uh, on UCF101, this, uh, this, this difference is even more pronounced between uh, sideways training with VGG, uh, VGG net train with sideways uh, versus VGGNet's uh, train with uh, regular by propagation. Uh, so, uh, so, so this uh, learning mechanism, at least on this data set, uh, seems to be uh, valid. It's important to note that there's, uh, this is not state of the art. There are like uh, uh, higher uh, uh, numbers. However, this is not the goal of, of, of this project because here we are more interested to see if sideways is a uh, learning, uh, proper valid learning mechanism. And in order to get state of the art results, you have to uh, have different models, special temporal models. And you also have to pre-train them on a large data set, presumably in the self-supervised way. Uh, otherwise, you get overfitting. Uh, so finally, even though that our prim primary motivation is not really biological plausibility, uh, it is actually quite interesting to see that uh, uh, in the, in the built eye view, uh, similar models uh, have been uh, introduced very recently, uh, independently from us. So they are coming from, from different uh, uh, labs and it's claimed that uh, this way of doing uh, uh, unrolling and this, this this kind of you know like like considering the time during the update cycle is more uh, biologically uh, plausible and uh, of course the reason is that uh, in reality back propagation uh, cannot be instantaneous it, it, it takes some time uh, okay so this is uh, the final final slide and here again we have proposed sideways which is a new training mechanism. Uh, so sideways exploits uh, those uh, uh, important properties in the while you are working with the temporal signals such as uh, smoothness, uh, redundancy. Uh, we increase the efficiency by adapting concepts of uh, pipelining uh, instruction into uh, deep learning training. Uh, we trade off mathematical correctness for the speed. So uh, in the sideways, we we replace uh, gradients with their more more noisy variant uh, that we call pseudo gradients. Uh, we have achieved uh, very promising results uh, with sideways uh, training. In some situations, we get even better generalization. Uh, and then finally, uh, sideways seems to be more realistic or more biologically plausible uh, than uh, backpropagation. So, so those are all, all, all the properties. Uh, uh, but of course, this is like very preliminary work uh, yet, and we, we, uh, I'm curious to see how this uh, evolves uh, in, into the future. Okay, that's, that's all. So this concludes the, the, all the talks. Uh, so thank you for coming. We thank our sponsor, Samsung. Uh, the next meeting will be in March next year. Uh, we don't have a fixed date yet. It will be most likely March 12th or 19th, uh, but we haven't settled this yet. The sponsor will be SAS, and most likely uh, there will be, it, the meeting will be more targeted at medical applications. So stay tuned. Thank you. So please enjoy the beverages and, and light dinner in the, in the back. <laughs>